Hey guys, this is Ben Schaefer, your Bible teacher, with another uh, installment of the book of Hebrews. I am so excited to come to you today. Hope you're well. Hope you're refreshed and ready to go. We're going to be uh, opening up our Bibles to chapter uh, 12. We're going to crack open uh, Hebrews once again, but we're going to be going through the chapter 12 today. So um, I'm excited to get started today so let's start with an op with open with a word of prayer thank you jesus for the fact that you're here with us today even via technology gosh thank you for watching out for us because uh, of course god we know that it's by your grace that we can even uh peer into your word and peer onto your word lord it's because of a miracle that you've done in our lives that we're able to understand the things that we understand but lord we don't take that uh, and give ourselves glory, we give you glory. Because, of course, just like the writer of God, the writer of Hebrews, um, has warned us against uh, falling away. We've, we've heard his warnings, four of them, in fact, so far. And, and then we also just soaked up his inspiration, Lord. And we pray that that inspiration of chapter 11 of the patriarchs, the, the saints of old, who uh, have uh, led, led lives of faith, would be, in fact, our legacy. Um, that's my prayer, Lord. You give us the ability to leave that legacy. And uh, once again, I pray that your power of the Holy Spirit would lead today's conversation, today's lesson. And in, in Jesus' name, I pray all these things. Amen. Again, my name is Ben Schaefer. Thank you so much for watching on the channel. As we do every week, I put out a video about 40 to 50 minutes long and we examine portions of scripture. And again, I'm not a big, I'm, I don't have any huge credentials in my past to make me um, uh, <laughs> qualified to do this. I just have the Holy Spirit. Um, and I, that's all I have to bring to the table today. And again, it's my humble privilege and, and actually desire um, for you, the listener, to be able to see past what I'm saying and look into what the, the scripture is saying. So past me and and lead to what God says. So today, you guys ready to get started? Okay, let's get started. The writer has concluded his tour through the Hall of Faith for everybody. Did you enjoy it? I hope you enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. I've, I've read through chapter 11 a uh, number of times now. But this time, every time I do, it just like brings me a whole slew of new refreshing material in my mind to, to examine and, and bring me revelation. Uh, we've, we've obviously examined life after life of many Old Testament saints and they're learning, uh, we're learning so much from their examples of faith, what faith lo looks like in, their, in our lives, what faith looked like in their lives. Um, the writer began this tour with a, uh, a warning. Do you remember this? Um, in chapter 10, it was a warning to the church, the listener, uh, the, the reader of this, of this book. The warning explained the consequences of shrinking back. A um, number, of, number of weeks ago, um, man, it seems like so long ago, we were in chapter 10. I don't know if you remember this, but it was one of the, it was the fourth, uh, one of four warnings that the writer of Hebrews um, issued to us. Specifically, he was concerned about the Christians in those days. What were they doing? Well, they were slipping back. They were slinking back. Um, they were slipping back to old Judaism, old Jewish practices of the day. Um, living, living with an eye for eternity was not something that they were really um, into. Um, and in a vain attempt to pres preserve um, something about their earthly lives, they gave up eyes for eternity. That's really what was going on. In his day, the writer uh, of, of the book of Hebrews uh, was witnessing the church suffer great persecution. If you if you know your Bible history, you know this was an era that was extremely hard to live if you were in fact a Christian. Um, and specifically the Jews were the ones that were causing all the problems. So the temptation was likely to return to Judaism, if you think about it. I mean I, I would be I would be tempted to do that. Which was a relatively safe thing to do in the Roman period, in this period, um, with the Romans surrounding the city and, and sieging the city, or not, I shouldn't say sieging, I mean, I more mean ruling. And, uh, but in doing so, they were, they were basically reversing, the writer was saying, or maybe the word repudiating, um, what the Lord 
has brought to them in that day. They, they were doing that. They, that's a good way of putting it, I think. They were sacrificing, this is the point, they were sacrificing something eternal, at least this is what I see. They were sacrificing something eternal, um, meaning a heavenly reward, for something, for the sake of something that's passing, an earthly reward, for earthly gain. You see that, see that, uh, that juxtapose or uh, that contrast? That's the really one I want you to guys to get, is these people, the listener or the reader, had this problem. They were sacrificing heavenly eternal reward for earthly, uh, for earthly gain, and, and for the sake of, they were sacrificing heavenly reward for the sake of earthly reward. That's basically the way to put it. They were giving up something heavenly, a heavenly reward, for gaining, uh, in the vain attempt, to gain something of earthly gain. Man, I'm trying to, so hard to explain that. But that's what I want you to hold on to. So to inspire his audience to live out their witness, uh, even to face trials and persecutions, he presented the example, example after example after example of Old Testament saints who did exactly that. And that's what we just got done examining in the chapter 11. So before we move on to chapter 12, I just kind of wanted, I kind of lied, I kind of like to go and reread the last two chap, last two verses of chapter eleven. So let's go for it um, with the conclusion that he that he penned, in verses thirty nine and forty of chapter eleven. Let's read it together. It says this: and all these, having gained approval through their faith, did not receive what was promised, because God had provided something better for us, so that apart from us they would not be made perfect. So the writer says all these saints gains, gain God's approval by living out their faith. And they lived in this way despite never seeing an iota, or may I say the full measure, the full, the full capacity of the promise that, that they were promised in this side of eternity. In fact, they're still waiting for it. For it was not God's intention to do so. The writer says, it was not in this world that he intended to give them the promise. This fallen world is not the place to expect to receive all of God's inheritance. Do you, do you hear that, Christian? Do you hear that, brothers and sisters? This is not the place. This is something I'm kind of, kind of getting ahead of our, myself, but this is the inspiration. That's our. That should be our inspiration the writer is jotting down why did he bring up chapter 11 anyway well this is our inspiration is that they put their stake in something eternal that was beyond now that they put they put their eyes for eternity they put faith they had their faith rooted staked in something that's not in this fallen kingdom it's in the established rooted firm kingdom that, that the bible outlines in gruesome detail God's plan is to provide the inheritance, an inheritance, to his children, to all the saints that we just got done talking about, to all his children, all at once. Do you know that? All of us will receive what is better than this someday to come. Not all of us. <laughs> Not all of us have died at the same time. So how am I? How are we supposed to do this? How are we supposed to have every everybody there at the same time? Well, guess what? That's exactly what's going to happen. All the Old Testament saints, all the Gentile church, everybody is going to stand before the white throne, the great white throne of judgment. This is going to be the dispensary. <laughs> this is going to be when inheritance is given, reward is given. So all the saints of all the history of ever written about and or ever you know all the way from adam to today will all be on the same plane before jesus christ it says we will enter god's glory together i think about all those hymns when when the road's called up yonder or however that goes we're we're, <laughs> we're all gonna go together and together we will receive our respective share of Christ's inheritance. Okay, so what am I talking about? I'm talking about resurrection. I'm not talking about our spirit. Like, you're saying, well, what, wait a minute, Ben. What about when we die? Do we just 
stay in the dirt. No, no, no. What I'm saying is the day where our spirit that's in heaven after we pass away is reunited with our body, imperishable. So God's going to resurrect your physical body just like he did with Christ. And he's going to re reinitiate your inhabitants in said body. And we are all going to stand before Jesus with incorruptible bodies, which means we're able to stand in his presence. Well, so will all the saints. They have not received their inheritance. They have not received their resurrected bodies yet. In fact, you're going to see in the verses to come evidence to this. So God's delay in rewarding the saints is a part of the plan. I want you guys to see this. This, this is a plan that's intended to bring all of God's children together all at the same time. Did you read what, did you hear what we just read? All of his children are called to testify through a life uh, of patient, and I'll call patient and expectant faith. I love those two words, patient and expectant. Expectant, like, oh man, like Christmas is coming, but patient. You know, uh, I think about, <laughs> my, it's a horrible example, but my old dog, Hooch, was his name. You would, uh, <laughs> you would, you'd get a dog, you know, we used to feed him KFC, or a dog treat, or, or uh, some sort of a bone, and you'd hold it right in front of his nose, and he'd be like, <gasps> I gotta have it, I gotta have it. But he was patient. He knew that if he grabbed after it, I'd pull it away. So he was patient and expectant at the same time. That's me as a Christian. I'm going, oh man, I gotta have it. But I'm patient. See that? I don't know, it's a silly, silly uh, illustration, but I hope you get it. Um, all of us are expected, or God intends us to live a life of testimony of expectant and patient faith. We await our reward in heaven. And, and again, I don't know if you've heard this kind of, lesson. I don't know if you've had a teacher talk to you about this, but this is what scripture talks about over and over and over and over and over again is reward in heaven. We don't grow faint that is what the next portion of this, this these two verses are saying. We await a reward for heaven and while we do so, we don't grow weary. This is where the writer picks up as he moves into chapter 12 with an exhortation. But before I do that, I just want to reiterate Guys, I really do want to encourage you to look into the aspect of reward. Guys, reward is heavenly reward. We talked about it a lot. But I don't know that I don't, everybody I talk to, and I mean I talk to so many people, <laughs> just joking, uh, is they struggle with this concept. Do you struggle with this concept? I mean, literally, you should comment, write me, write me uh, an email, shoot me an email, shoot me a comment. Do you struggle with, do you have a problem with the concept of heavenly reward and working for heavenly reward, specifically working for it? Like, faith without works is dead type of thing, James 1. I mean, it, persevering like a race, do you feel like you're being duped or do you feel like it's works-based and, and you feel this little... Uh, opposition in your spirit about anything about reward I've had people actually great saints of uh, you know older older gentlemen and women who have been believers their whole life talk to me about how conceited that is that theology or they'll use the word selfish like, well I don't need reward I <laughs> I challenge you to think about this where are you at with this because according to scripture we're not talking about salvation guys let me be clear not talking about salvation. I'm talking post-salvation. Living a life, faith and works working together. God says he rewards those who seek him. Rewards. What am I talking about? Inheritance. The king's inheritance. So, got to have this firm in your mind before we move on. This is a big deal. I'm not talking about uprooting your faith. I'm talking about reading what the Bible says and believing it. In fact, I, I have to believe that our behavior problems as a human race might be a little less narcissistic and selfish if we actually lived according to what the Bible says in Hebrews, specifically, chapter 12. 
I just got to believe that there would be a whole lot better behavior. Okay, I'm ready to go. All right, so chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, let's read it together. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. What an amazing two verses. Maybe you guys remember that, you Sunday school goers, remembering, uh, maybe maybe that's a memory verse that you had to remember and uh, memorize. But guys, referring back to chapter 11, the writer says first in this first verse, since we have a, such a great legacy or a great cloud, he calls it a cloud, but what he's talking about is examples. I just love this phrase. It's so artful. It's so like inspirational. A cloud of witnesses. It reminds us that, number one, that the saints of old are still in spirit. <laughs> Notice this. This is an artful way of saying they don't have their bodies yet. They're a cloud. See that? I love that. These witnesses have not yet received their physical bodies, so you've got to make sure that you understand this. They're awaiting something. What are they waiting for? Why are they waiting? Well, we just read that in the first, the last two, last two verses of chapter 11. It's because of us. We are all, for the appointed time, are waiting for that appointed time to stand before the great white throne. So like us, they await their resurrection. Once again, the writer emphasizes that apart from us, these saints will not see the fulfillment of God's promises. So the word witnesses, we gotta tie, gotta tie this in. You know, some people don't understand what witness means. Witness, you know, we'll, we'll talk about eyewitnesses or I witnessed something or she witnessed something. Okay, this is not what that word is. There, uh, let me let me read you what I have here. This is an exhortation, beginning with the notion of laying aside sin. Okay, um, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm getting ahead of myself. The witness is actually a witness in a stand uh, for a judge. They're, in other words, the writer isn't saying that the saints are watching us, but instead they're in a stand at a in a judicial system. They're, they're witnessing. They're they're, um, they're speaking. They're speaking to you. Um, he means we should be watching them as it takes, as in taking notes of their example. So, uh, and, and if we're taking notes of them, then we should try to do as they did. That's the point of this whole verse. So a great cloud of witnesses. What's this meaning? Well, I hope you can understand. It doesn't refer, once again, to an observer, but rather to one with a testimony okay so let me wrap that up it doesn't mean a observer but instead it it refers to one with a testimony so secondly the writer goes on to say laying aside every encumbrance okay an encumbrance uh, it says encumbrance and sin so that we may run the race set before us okay so there's several important elements to this this phrase um, it's kind of an exhortation beginning with the laying the laying down um, or laying aside sin I love that word it's like laying it aside um, the Greek word that's transliterated right there or translated um, is the word encumbrance is used only once in the New Testament the word commonly used uh, is the, the word that it's that it was translated, that's translated to mean, is a word that's commonly used for running races, okay? Um, another way of, um, my, my dad and, and I love to watch drag racing. Another way of, of um, explaining this is removing drag. So in drag racing, that was the whole science behind it, is removing aerodynamic drag so that you might go the fastest in the race and beat all your opponents. That's the same words that are going on here in scripture, is that you are to remove the drag, or resistance is another way of saying it, resistance. 
So anything that negatively impacts a runner's ability to run the fastest he possibly can. Now, I know I never was a really great swimmer. I've had a lot of friends who are uh, swimmers, but it's so funny. I'd always, I'd always, you know, laugh because all my swimmer friends would shave every hair on their entire body. There would be no hair on their arms or no hair on their legs. They would shave it all. Why do they shave it? Because they don't want one hair to slow them down when they're in the water and they're, they're going through the water just like this. They don't want any hair on their arms. They don't want any encumbrance. They put their head in a cap and they put their goggles on, everything streamlined, and they go as fast as they possibly can. That's what, the, that's what this rider's talking about. So obviously in a foot race is kind of what they were talking about. And in those days, they were talking about Olympics. The Olympics was a huge deal in, in, Roman, uh, in Roman culture. The Olympics were still were a big deal and still are today. Well, in, in in foot races, that was a big deal. So you would want to lay out anything that would slow you down when you race. So some of the takeaways are when you race, you are trying to win. Okay, that's number one. When when I set out to to race, I'm setting out to win. I'm not setting out just to blow a bunch of energy and then go home, and setting out to lose. I'm setting out to win. You see what I'm saying? That's how we should that's how we should view this this Christian life. You can't achieve that goal of winning as long as you run encumbered, right? I mean, my kid used to run around with a cape, running running around with a cape and watching it flip behind him. You know what that is? That's an encumbrance. It's it's dragging down wind, right? It's it's slowing you down. Well, you're not going to run a race with a cape on, right? Likewise, you're not going to put a big brick in your shoe and and uh, and go run a race. Um, you're just not going to. You know, if you're going to run a race, you're going to ensure that all the possibilities for you winning are in place. You want every advantage that you can. Likewise, we want every or should want every advantage that we can get for our race is way more important than anything described in the scripture. Any any Olympic race, any anything that you watch on TV, a race, you know, like I'm even thinking um, uh, the swimmer, Michael Phelps. <laughs> as cool as that was, as many gold medals as he won, that race meant nothing. Because that gold, I'm, I'm sorry, Michael Phelps fans, but you, the race that you're running, is far more important than that race that he won to win the gold medal. Why? Why do I say that? Well, it's because the gold is perishing. In fact, 1 Corinthians 9, 25, read this for you. 9, 25, 26, 27 says it best when he says, um, everyone who competes in the games exercises, I mean, he's talking about the Olympics, in the Olympics, exercises self-control in all things. They then do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. Therefore, I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as to not just beat the air, but I discipline my body and make it a slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. Do you see that? Do you remember... Do you remember the, the the whole concept we talked about? Maybe I'm going backwards just a little bit, but the master who bought here, I'll just say it, the one I'm trying to say, the master who bought you is the one who we're trying to please. And again, I'm not talking about salvation. Salvation's a free gift of grace. Okay? That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about post-Christianity, post post-Christian. <laughs> Not postmodernism, not post-Christian, but I'm talking about after salvation. We run a race for a purpose, and it's to please the master. Guys, when you're a Christian, you are, how do I say that? You're joined to Christ. You, when you, How else Americans hate this? I, I know we do not talk about this kind of thing, but he's a master. He's our master. He's our leader. He's our king. That's Those are words that we don't even use anymore. We're all independent Americans that have freedom and nobody's going to tell us what to do. Christianity, you need to cleanse yourself from that, that notion if you're going to be a Christian. Because Jesus is our king, our master, 
our Lord. And we humbly submit under his authority. So when we run a race, we run a race to please the master. We don't run the race to, to and only receive blessings or only receive inheritance. We do both. We receive reward and we bring glory in the same token, in the same time. We glorify the Father while we run. We glorify uh, his grace and mercy and his providence, his blessings in our life. And we tell the story of the gospel as we run. So check that out. So back to the verse, 1 Corinthians 9, 25 through 27. So notice Paul, how he echoes the writer's line of thought in here. We're both talking about Olympics and racing. He says that uh, he must exercise self-control in a, in a race of life to ensure a good outcome. Self-control. What am I talking about? Well, I'm talking about how the fact is we're in bodies that, that are in opposition to God's will every single day of our life. So it denotes a, a, a battle. So, so that even after he, he has helped others, it says, preach and help people live their life uh, to please the Lord, he himself was in danger of being disqualified from winning his own prize, it says. The prize being a great imperishable reward. That's the prize he was talking about. So if, if you know, if we're going to be dis if if we're going to be potentially disqualified, doesn't it make you kind of sober up a little bit? And um, instead of you just going out and doing a bunch of great Christian ministry, make sure that you're understanding that it takes conditioning. It's like running a race. So if we want to follow the lead of the Old Testament saints, I'm talking about Abraham, Moses, prophets. We must begin by setting aside the sin, setting it aside, like just setting it aside that is holding us back from obedience. Now, this is cool. I think I had this thought. You know what I love about that that phrase? It's just like this. You know, I I understand counseling is very important and we do need counselors. We need to talk about it. We need to process through things. But I love how this word, it gives me hope that number one, it's possible. Um, those sins that so easily entangle us. Do you know what you're do you know what I'm talking about? I mean, do you do you know what that is in your life? Search your heart right now. Try it. Search your heart and I bet I just 100% guarantee you know what you must do right now. I'm serious. <laughs> the the sins in my life are numerous, but I know exactly what the Holy Spirit is telling me that I need to set aside. What about you? I mean, I'm, I'm being honest. I'm totally being vulnerable, vulnerable here. Um, I need to lay it aside, guys. I need to put away. I need to put it away. I need to walk away from it. Don't play around on the edges of the cliff, so to speak. Do you know what that is in your life? I bet you do. May I suggest that's the Holy Spirit's been speaking to you and trying to get you to be able to be unencumbered so that you don't forfeit the glorious inheritance, the imperishable inheritance of the Lord God. So set it aside right now, Christian, brother and sister. I encourage you right now to set it aside. Maybe you even need to stop the, the video, my silly jampering, and let the Holy Spirit do his work. And set it aside. Confess your sin. Set it aside. In doing so, you will free yourself from all drag weight, all non, <laughs> the unnecessary drag on your life that's literally preventing you from winning your race. So if you do this, you can expect that the prize that lies ahead of you will be far greater. It will far surpass whatever menial temporary pleasures that you've been giving yourself, that you've been, you've been propping up in your life. If you provide that for yourself today, just know that that is nothing compared to, it's like this, it's like this cup. If this is my sin, 
that I prov provide myself every day. I have a, the Bible says, I have a dump truck full of whatever it is that I think so great here. It's way greater there. Do you see that? We must all recognize that though we have been saved by the penalty, uh, saved from the penalty of sin by the grace of God, we are still called to wrestle. We're wrestlers. We're, we're supposed to wrestle with it. What are we wrestling with? Our brothers and sisters? No. We're wrestling with us, yourself. Think about that. You struggle and persevere with yourself. We are not furthering our salvation by persevering and wrestling. We have to make sure that's clear. Why? Because the Lord, be, point blank, I'll tell you, because the Lord won the battle for you, period. Hope you hear me out. But I am talking about ensuring that we will not be disqualified from receiving the prize. That's what fighting and persevering is for. Finally, notice how the, the writer describes the race of our life uh, of faith. It's a race that's set before us. Get it? It's set before us. Simply put, God set it up. He set it before you. God did it. The Lord, in his sovereign will, prepared a race for each one of you. Some of them will have, some people's races will have diseases. Some people's races will have poverty, um, richness, uh, wealth, um, extreme hardships, tribulations, extreme pleasure, extreme uh, glory and and easy peasy life. Some some will have a joyful joyful family. Someone will have a terrible family. Maybe you'll experience uh, along your race a tragedy. Some people a tra uh, tragedy lists life. Um, some people will have strong health. Some people will have terrible health. Um, some people will live peaceful lives of faith in their race, while others will be persecuted and perhaps even martyred. The Lord has set the race before you. That's, that's a good thing to let settle in, set, just sink in right now. We don't choose, He does. We don't choose it, He does. He didn't ask us to approve of the race before we take it. I think about on video games, you know, when you're playing those little racing games and you get to choose the course. You're like, oh man, I'm going to take the easy one with the really, really swooping terms so I don't have to like wreck. No, he decides what course it is. Yes. Do you, do you see that? Do you, are you okay with that? Because if you're not okay with that, you're going to have some serious issues. Because God in the sovereign will has decided what your course will be. Running with endurance. Let's get back to that. The writer says, endurance. Endurance simply implies don't give up. Don't give up. Like a runner rounding the first bend and, um, and staring at the finish line. Coming around the bend. Don't stop running till you cross that line and you rip, rip that rip that ribbon with your chest <sighs> what a shame it would be to run a good race of faith sacrificing for the lord and 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 uh being a great witness only to give up on the final lap and lay down to succumb to sin and to indulge our fears and weaknesses that's what it looks like to just give up we have all struggles in our faith in fact the lord has ensured that all of us will have struggles and trials and tribulations. Did you hear me say that? He has made sure of it. It's, it's a testimony of his love towards us. The, the, these tests are God's way of qualifying. Listen to me really carefully. God's qualifying you right now if you're going through something very hard. He's qualifying us for a reward. Jesus set our example. Set, set, set a example for us to view. But God says that trials and tribulation, Christian, I'm hopefully speaking to you right now. If you're going through something really hard right now, you are being qualified for a reward. James 1, chapter 1, verses 2, 3, and 4. Let's read this together. Uh, I know you guys have all heard it. Let me say one more thing before I read this. A test 
these tests that you're going through are God's way of qualifying you, right? I said that, right? But you can't win if you don't run. You see that? You can't win if you don't run, so to speak. That's why I'm going to read you this verse. You can't win if you don't run. All right. Now, let me read it. Chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. You've heard this before, right? Knowing that he, the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect results, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. We are to consider trials in our life as what? Joy. Hmm. Because the... the okay, so I just want to get this through you guys' head, in my own head, is that the existence of trials and tribulations is evidence of God's love. The Lord is at work. That's what it's evidence of. He's working. He's moving. He's offering us an opportunity to demonstrate endurance, right? He's offering you an opportunity to demonstrate endurance. Brothers and sisters, just think if the next trial that hits you, you, th you thought of it in that way. Endurance. To walk with trust, trust in the Lord's promises, endurance to make the sacrifice when it's time to make the, t the sacrifice, and, and, and lay down treasure if you have to, whatever it takes to move the kingdom forward. That's, that's basically what it looks like. Endurance not shrinking back from trials to seek comfort in the world. Seeking the world and the pleasures the world has off to offer is an exact opposition to running your race. Comfort with materialism, ego, lust, um, drugs, you know, career. Man, I can think of a billion things. Those materialistic comforts are in direct opposition to you running your race. In fact, those are encumbrances. And that endurance that I just got done talking about will bring a result of ensuring we lack none of the rewards the Lord offers us for obedience. That's what I'm talking about. So, of course, as usual, our ultimate example is found, once again, in Jesus Christ. In verse 2, what does it say? Verse 2. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. So, basically, what this, let me paraphrase. Look at Jesus. That's what it says. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Think that word, fix your, that song. Fix your eyes upon Jesus. He is the author and perfecter of our faith. He did it for us. He did it before us. The Greek word author can also mean pioneer. Did you know that? I love that. Or originator. He originated. He's the pioneer originator. He's the inventor of faith is another way of saying it. He, he broke into an industry. <laughs> he revolutionized the industry. Jesus pioneered our faith. He authored it. He established it. He established a way to salvation. So further, Paul says in Ephesians 2, got another scripture for you, chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, that he brought saving faith to each of us as the starting point for our relationship with God. So, so don't think of it as the end where you can lean back on your haunches <laughs> with your life and your lazy lazy boy, but it's the beginning of a relationship. It's the starting point. Does that make sense? Let me read it for you. It's chapter 2, verses 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is the gift of God. Not of yourself, the gift of God. Not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Wow, that's crazy. It's, it's, he's doing more than authoring or pioneer faith. Christ perfected your faith. He, he didn't just come up with a methodology. He perfected it. He was in the science lab, and he perfected the formula himself. He endured all of the hardship to make that possible. So the Greek word for perfecter, in that I looked that up, means to carry on through completion. Isn't that cool? Jesus just doesn't start us down the road to salvation and says, See you later. He walks with you. He walks with you. 
He brings us into the state of glory by his power, not yours. Does that make you? That should just set, should set you free right now. He sets us free by that. He brings us into, into a state of glory by his power, not by our own. Between the beginning and the end lies the course. Between the beginning of your life and the end of your life lies a billion hairpin turns of your life on this course that you're on. We have a part to play in the mapping out of that journey. Did you know this? I want to, I want to give you a little insight to the way this thing works. Some choices pay greater rewards than others. I'm serious. The key to taking the right road is to have a clear view of the destination. This is the way this works. Rewards work this way. Some decisions we make have a greater weight of reward and consequence. So the writer says, fix your eyes on Jesus and what he did in the earthly life he led in his journey as, a, as an example. He had an immense trial set before him, didn't he? And of course, of obedience, he, he gave obedience to the, the will of the Father. So that's something that we need to think about. He was tempted to seek refuge in the world and avoid the cross altogether. You relate to that? Yeah, I do. Obedience required Jesus to set aside everything, including life and his power. He had power. He had incredible power. He had to lay, he had to lay aside power and life. Crazy. So he, but he was willing to endure these trials because of the great joy set before him. What about you? Are you only able to per persevere because of the hobby that you have? Are you only able to persevere the life that you have because of the money that you have? Or the family that you have? Or something else that this life provides you? Do you have your treasure in the right place? Is your joy set before you? I'm talking about the joy of eternity. I'm talking about what God won for you, what Jesus is calling us to. That joy of pleasing the Father. That's what I'm talking about. Not you. Not pleasing you. I'm talking about pleasing the Father. Is that out in front of you? The joy of receiving a great inheritance. Is that out in front of you? The joy of seeing uh, people called by faith walking in towards that inheritance. Do you see... Is that a part of your DNA? Is that a part of your day-to-day? -day? Um, I, I was in a business conference the other day, or a seminar or webinar, and they were using the term, my North Star. It was talking about um, our business North Star. I don't know why they use that term all the time, but it's the, it's the big picture. It's the BHAG, the big, hairy, audacious goal of any business. Is that your BHAG? Is that your big, hairy, audacious goal? <laughs> that's your north star hebrews 12 3 let me read this for consider him who had endured such hostility by sinners against himself so that you will not grow weary and lose heart so this is jesus again we're supposed to look at jesus he's the one who shows us how to live a life of faith in the face of trials bingo he's the one he endured harsh treatment the hands of sinners right just as you will endure harsh treatment you know, <laughs> some people might say, yeah, Ben, you know, but you haven't seen what I've had to endure, right? It's bad. You might have the testimony of great suffering. I mean, great abuse, huge injustices. You may might have endured a life so far of so much tragedy you could make a movie out of it. I mean, incredible loss. I'm sure many of us have, have endured many things in life that could just make anyone shrink back and seek seek uh, shelter or maybe even compensation for for some some kind of uh, spiritual pursuit like god you owe me that was really bad but if we compare our trials to to those jesus faced we kind of come up shorthanded don't we so as the writer says in verse four five and six let's read this you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood and you're striving against sin. See, you hear that? Verse 5. 
and you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. It says, My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. Crazy, right? Coming down to the end. Stick with me on this one, okay? So, so you have your friends, right? That have come to you and said, how can a loving God cause trials and tribulations in my life? And how can he do this and, and make me hurt, you know? Um, have you, I mean, first of all, before we go there, have you ever had that, that, that idea in your head? Have you ever worked so hard to set aside sin and endure trials that it required you to give up your life? Okay, no, probably not. Obviously, the answer is no, which is why the writer poses this question rhetorically. Okay, so we can't say that our trials have been so hard and encumbering in sin it, it is necessary and understandable. We can't really say that. We can't say that we're just like Jesus. But we still have more we can do to endure and run the race. In fact, Jesus says the servant is not greater than the master. If the father was willing to demand our master die to please him, is it too much to say that he might ask us to die to please him? It's a big question. Then I'm stepping on my toes, my own toes, when I write it down on my piece of paper. If God asks the master to die, is it too much to ask of the servant to die? Me? If our trials bring us to the end of ourselves, as it did with Christ, am I okay with just saying, so be it? Because our reward is in heaven, and our reward in heaven will be great. In fact, this church that, that it, the writer is talking to sought to escape their trials by sinfully retreating to spiritual life. Whoa, that's, that's wild, right? The life of, an, of a religious person was their way of getting away from trials and tribulations. That's, that's kind of telling. So this sin was their escape from trials, which the Lord delivered to perfect them. You see that? So they ran from it to perfect through endurance, to perfect through endurance, perfecting through endurance. So to those who see trials as a reason to indulge in sinful options that are given to you day to day, the writer, the writer rebukes his audience saying, you have forgotten the whole reason God gives you trials in the first place. Trials are set, sent as disp disciplinary measure measures by God. I cannot talk today. Trials are sent as disciplinary measures by God. The writer quotes from Psalm 3. Did you see that? Psalm 3. The psalmist says, Don't regard lightly or reject the discipline of the Lord. We reject the Lord's discipline when we do not take advantage of the trials he sends us. To use them to become a better witness of love and faith and joy in the Lord. We totally disregard it. If we if we reject those, we we waste it. Some some might say we we uh, we throw it away. To learn our weakness and crucify our flesh is the opportunity that if, that is afforded us every time we come against a trial or tribulation. Imagine if your father grounded you for a week as a discipline for something you did wrong, and then imagine that instead of obeying that restriction, that you would sneak out of the house every night anyway. You would be rejecting the discipline of the Father. Right? Yes, I'm talking to you, the crazy teenager who, <laughs> who snuck out of your house. So, and rather than feeling regret and learning a lesson that would pay dividends in the future and prevent you from huge hardship, you would have missed the whole point of the discipline. You would miss the whole point. And you would very likely repeat the same offenses in the future possibly with even greater consequences the next time. Does that make sense? So that's what the writer's talking about right now. Embrace your discipline. Embrace it. It's a loving father behind the disciplinary measure. See, Satan wants you to think discipline is abuse. Um, it's, Satan sets it up as a counterfeit to think that you are a victim. Wow. Chapter 12, verse 7 through 11 it says this, It is for discipline that you endure 
God deals with you as his as with his sons for what son is there whom his father does not discipline but if you are without discipline of which all have become partakers then you are illegitimate children and not sons furthermore we have earth we had earthly fathers to discipline us and we respected them shall we not much rather be subject to fathers of spirit the father of spirits and live for they disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them but he disciplines us for our good so that we may share his holiness. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful, no kidding. Yet to those who have been trained by it afterwards, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. When we confront a trial of any kind, whether emotional, material, physical, financial, whatever, we are encountering a course of the Lord set before us. It is a form of discipline the Lord is using to grow us spiritually. Do you see it like that? I hope you do. It's hard to see it like that sometimes, right? And we only gain that benefit if we go for it, if we endure it, we run it. Accepting it as a loving act of the Father who is disciplining us for our good. So running after it, go through it. The Lord works in a similar way with his children because he loves us. He doesn't want us to continue in the sin and suffer our loss and the loss specifically of the reward that's in store. So he brings us discipline in the forms of trials here on earth. These trials move us over time away from sin and fleshly behaviors and into a closer spiritual walk with him. Guys, that is the way it is. That's my, that's my life story. That's my testimony. You know, but only this will have the effect only if we accept them as discipline, not as a victimized abuse. We've got to see it as something good for us. Perhaps we might say that it is unkind of the Lord to bring us these kinds of things. Guys, I got a lot of friends who say this to me, like, how can God do this? He's a bully. He's unkind. How can he do this to his son? He's a murderer. He murdered his son. And saying that, you know, the Bible says it is proof for his love, right? That we came across that. But it still doesn't, <laughs> it still doesn't make it easy to explain to people. So the Bible says it's proof of his love that these things come because these hardships come because they have good eternal outcomes. When we ask the Lord to give us an easy life, this is really what I'm saying. This is a great argument for someone who says this um, about God is that it's a real immature, by the way, it's a real immature understanding, I'll say, of what trials are based upon what I just explained. Do you see... This, let, me, let me throw this out there. When we or you or us ask the Lord to give us an easy life, um, absent of trials and tribulations and disappointment and tragedies, here's what we're really asking him to do. We're asking him to not discipline us. All right, number one. Number two, we're, allowing, we're, uh, we're asking him to allow us to remain as fleshly and sinful as we as he found us. Don't fix us. Don't do anything with us. That's what you're asking him. And last, we're asking him to refrain from growing us spiritually so that we can please him through an endurance and gain eternal reward. Would a loving father accept those terms if a child asked you to forego discipline so he or she could grow up spoiled and immature? Would you agree to that arrangement as a parent? As the writer says, no loving father would ever let that happen. So when people say that God is mean and he's not, he, he in essence is a jerk and uh, a bully, their understanding for how parenting happens must be very, very weak. Because no loving father would ever allow that to happen. In fact, if the father in heaven neglected to bring us trials for the sake of discipline, it would mean he, we weren't really his children at all. So, scary part of this equation is, is if you are actually living a life that's free from trials and tribulations, you almost have to ask yourself, are you being trained? Are you God's children? No, um, <laughs> you aren't. Can you discipline the child of another family like a stranger? Uh, in a supermarket and they need a spanking? No, you cannot. You can't touch them. 
you don't touch them at all. You know, you ever been in the supermarket and there's this bratty kid and he, he just needs a big whopping? <laughs> just joking. But you just, you just want to tell him, listen, kid, listen to your mom, blah, 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 blah. You can't say that. It's not your kid. Likewise, if, if you could live a free, a life free of God's discipline, it would only be possible if you weren't his kid. That is, if you weren't saved by grace. So the writer says, if we accept the discipline of our earthly fathers with understanding, then we should be able to accept the discipline of our heavenly father with understanding. That's what I'm thinking would be an incredible understanding to grasp onto today. We should welcome his discipline. Of course, we only benefit, we only gain benefits if we endure trials. With each challenge we face in life, we are at a crossroads orchestrated by himself. It's the course he has set for us. Consider these great trials to be evidence that we got a lot of growing up to do. That's another way of saying it. Next time you come up against a trial and tribulation, say, man, I got a lot of growing to do. The question is, will we receive, will we receive his discipline and learn the lesson and endure the trials and receive the reward? Here, I'll say it again. Will you today receive his discipline, learn the lesson, endure the trial, and receive the reward? Or will we reject his discipline, miss the lesson, shrink back from the trial, indulge our sin, and forfeit eternal reward? That's the two choices you have. Only two ways. Only two things. You have not endured to the point of shedding blood like Christ did, brothers and sisters, so fix your eyes on his example and repeat it over and over again. Run the race that he has set before you. Do so with endurance so that you will not be disqualified for the praise, for the prize, the perishable inheritance that awaits. God bless you guys. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I pray you would take the words. Um, Lord, it's such a rich chapter, rich, rich beginning to chapter 12. Uh, this episode, this season, or this lesson, I pray that you would just bless uh, the listener right now, that you would open up their eyes, their inside eyes, and you would open up their ears to hear. Oh, Father, but you would just open us uh, a new revelation, new level of revelation in our lives that we might grasp onto what it is to be a child of God that accept, accepts discipline, that sees trials and tribulations as more growing, more growing to do. We love you. We thank you for this time. Thank you for allowing it to happen and protecting it. May it grow. May it be used by your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great day.